local factors really do determine the rate of growth. So what we choose at a local level, at a suburb level, at a street level, really, and in the end, determines what the real estate is going to do over the long-term horizon. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, another code cracker. We're going to dig into property due diligence. Yes, we're going to have the conversation. How do we look for good information to go out there and choose a property that's going to stack up over time? It's a big conversation. A lot of people obviously listening today already own some incredible assets. And of course, potentially you will be looking into the future for more property to build that amazing portfolio. Or you're listening and right now you're considering shopping for real estate inside of the property marketplace. Today, due diligence, how do you do it? What do you look for? And I'm going to give you everything you need to know about choosing a property as an investment. Hey, if it's your first time tuning into the show, welcome aboard, play the program in double speed, get your life back. And of course, welcome back all you urban property investors. You know the drill. We're going to do a show today. We never know if it's going to be a good one until we get to the end, but hopefully things come together. I actually think this could be a record-breaking episode. We could be here for hours. So make sure you play the show in double speed. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, you may see my trucker's hat. Uh, It is the new merch it's in. Does not suit my head. I look like a uh, crazy person with a trucker's hat on. Definitely doesn't work for the bald man. So uh, anyway, I like cruising with a bit of a hat. It keeps my head warm. Property due diligence. Let's get into it. Let's talk real estate. Let's have the real estate conversation. And I think obviously when it comes to choosing a piece of real estate, it is very, very important to make sure there are some good reasons as to why to buy real estate. And I have covered off some of this stuff in the past. The idea that we don't want to be a market maker. We don't want to be the first person to ever buy a certain typology of real estate or the first person ever to step foot in a marketplace and hope that works out. Not a good plan. We want evidence, good areas whereby there is a proven pathway of success. And of course, uh, we want property which is going to last us for 30 plus years. We're buying real estate today for our retirement Assuming we retire in 30 years' time, we want something to stand the test of time. We also want something easy to manage in our circle of confidence, something that isn't going to rattle us if the market conditions change. We're also ideally looking for a property which has trade-offs. It has some problems. And our job as a property investor is to solve those problems and turn a Uh, you know, ugly duckling, if you like, into a swan. Of course, we want a history of performance in real estate. We also want real estate, which is simple to understand, that we know what the behavior of the real estate is going to do. Is it going to be a growth property, a cash flow property? Is it going to be a hybrid of both? What type of return is it likely to produce? Is it going to be more cash flow, more capital growth, or a balanced mixture of the two? So when we're choosing a property, we have to take all of these things into consideration. How sellable the property is, what the sale potential after you buy the property is. Does the property have intrinsic value, things built in to help drive its performance? And of course, when it comes to choosing a property, And mirroring it to the property cycle, we need to know if the cycle and the price of the property match up. So there's a lot of things we need to do 
to get ourselves in a place where we've got the right pieces to the jigsaw puzzle. And we do this by using what is known as due diligence. Due diligence, if you don't know what it is, because uh, it's a uh, interesting set of words if for the first time hearing it, is really just a couple of fundamentals. Asset identification or asset allocation, like what you're trying to put together. A needs assessment around the property. Uh, due diligence identifies, if you like, growth strategies, trying to work out if a property is going to grow. If a property is in a community which is going to see future enhancement. And of course, due diligence is really the due diligence of both macro, micro and of course, uh, things like infrastructure and connectivity when it comes to real estate. And due diligence is also human profiling. So there's a lot to the jigsaw puzzle, hence why this could be the longest show in the history of uh, Australian real estate podcasting. Now, the reason I'm doing due diligence, I sort of talked about this last podcast that a lot of people do what I would refer to as level one due diligence. They're novice investors, first time investors. They're uncertain. They've got a lot of fear. Uh, Their concerns really uh, when it comes to what to choose, when to buy real estate, don't know when to start. Really, they have a lack of knowledge. And quite often, a lot of people buy their first property and don't end up holding it. Some do, but many tend to buy real estate out of some sort of money fear, out of a stab in the dark. They tend to listen to their friends and family who may not be professionals inside of the real estate. It's a real gut feel experience when people buy their first property. And for the most part, they tend to buy on a feeling. And of course, A feeling is what we would refer to as level one due diligence. It's like, you know, it's not a huge economic principle having a gut feeling that this might work out. And of course, for a lot of property investors, they get a bit nervous after they buy their first property because the feeling goes away and they start to question whether they had put together something which is proven or is really just a gut feel. And again, uh, there are levels to due diligence. And of course, due diligence level two, if you like, is a combination of level one due diligence, basically people having a bit of a go, and level three due diligence, which I'll talk to you about. Level three due diligence is really, really where people start to become quite serious about being a property investor. They want to know as much as possible. And today I'm going to talk to you about what level three due diligence is. Remember, level one due diligence is just kind of going to an open home, uh, you know, feeling good about a property, bit of gut intuition you know, some of that can help, but it can also cause a lot of drama. Level two is a little bit of what I'm about to talk to you about, which is level three due diligence, which is concrete stuff. And of course, level one due diligence was just a bit of a feeling. So as people become more professional as property investors, they tend to go up the ladder as to what they research when they choose a property to put it together. Again, First property, minimal due diligence, most people do. Uh, Level two due diligence is, you know, starting to know there's a little bit more than just going to an open home and buying a property on a Saturday afternoon. Level three, though, is the theory of knowledge. And this is where we have to research our real estate, make sure it's really, really suitable for the next phase of our life. And this is where we often research as a property investor doing level three due diligence. Economics, we'll look at research and data and we'll look at models that work. Remember, doing due diligence can be both 
quantitative and qualitative. Uh, you can do it at a desktop level or you can do it at a detail level. Qualitative due diligence is just rules of thumb. So in other words, you know, houses tend to perform very well in middle ring suburbs. It's a rule of thumb. Quantitative research is where you go into detailed information. You may get, for example, external reports on a suburb, on a location, on a street. You may get external people like valuers to look at real estate. So as a person doing due diligence on a property, you tend to use both qualitative and quantitative concepts to reduce your risk as a property investor. And remember, real estate, even though there are macro influences on real estate, macroeconomics, things like GDP, inflation, the cost of money, local factors really do determine the rate of growth. So what we choose at a local level, at a suburb level, at a street level, really and in the end determines what the real estate is going to do over the long-term horizon. There are certainly hotspots at a macro level, but really when we invest in real estate, for the most part, it's that micro level which is more important. So as a professional investor, I mean, I'm prescribed to a lot of knowledge and the general knowledge sources that I use from an economics point of view include Biz Shrapnel, Charter Cat Kramer. I use Urbis for infrastructure information and town planning. I use CoreLogic for real-time data in the real estate market. I use Cordell's for construction data in the real estate market. And I use uh, groups like SQM Research to give me research data on square meters, rates, as well as rental performance. I also use demographers such as McCrindle to give me insights into demographic trends. So again, like this is the power of knowledge because to assemble good due diligence, you're going to need professional uh, alliances to scrape that due diligence. And there are some great companies out there to align with, but for many people at a local level, it's very, very difficult to do. Now, here's that dreaded doorbell. Hang on one sec. I don't know. I think it was Jehovah's. Jehovah's at the door. Uh, who would have thought? I didn't even know Jehovah's were cruising. But uh, hey, there you go. I could have could have had a chat with God, but I've come back to the podcast because I'm a team player. And uh, hey, we're talking reports. And of course, there's some other great sources you can use for due diligence um, when it comes to assessing real estate. Things like Micro Burbs, Land Checker, Planning Authorities, Infrastructure Australia, Local Council, uh, Population ID, the Australian Bureau of Statistics. You've got, you know, great, great sources because there is so much data around today. It is a lot easier than ever before to start to research a location, a city, a suburb, to make sure it's going to grow and, of course, put us in a place where we can make money into the future. And of course, economics is great, but we also need property models. And I teach a fair few property models, probably my most famous property model. model. It's the 4X growth plan. You guys know this one. I speak about it every podcast. You know, buy well, good location, good marketplace. And of course, a predictor of growth, something like a view influences emotions and creates money out of real estate. 
Of course. <coughs> oh, now I'm choking. Hang on one sec. God, we've had the Jehovah's. Now I'm choking. Uh, I've got other models, uh, things like the pyramid of mobility. I've got models around cash flow strategies. I've got models around risks and gaps. The point of doing due diligence is to make sure that level three due diligence, that for a start, you know what you're doing, that you're actually buying real estate for a reason with a plan and it's going to mirror your time horizons. So we do that through models, we do it through research and we do it through economics. Generally though, if we want to create some steps around due diligence, we could have, for example, macro due diligence, micro due diligence, price due diligence, contractual due diligence and asset level due diligence where we look at a particular property. So let's start with micro today. Uh, at a micro level, how does due diligence work? Now, the cough's coming back. Wow. As I said, we never know how the podcast's going to go. So far, we've had the Jehovah's, we've had the cough. We haven't even got too far. We're 16 minutes in. So at a macro level, we want to understand where the markets are at. And of course, markets go through market bottoms, they go through recovery, they begin to rise again, and they can be hot. It's very, very important when we buy real estate at a, when analyzing macroeconomics and macro cycles that we just identify where we are in the cycle. For example, you could be in a booming market and of course you might make money quite quickly in a booming market, but you don't want to overpay in a booming market because after a market booms, of course it goes back to its next cycle and bottoms out. So if you buy and pay too much in a boom, you can wake up in the bottom of the market and have gone backwards, being negative in equity. Of course, at the bottom of the market, you might get a better price. You might even get a better location. So again, how you approach buying in the different cycles is important. You don't want to strangle a deal. You don't want to overcomplicate it but you also don't want to pay too much for real estate. And really by understanding where the macro cycles are at, you can start to work out where there's better value. And of course, we often refer to this as a cycle or pattern of symmetrics. Macro markets, for example, can move at different speeds. Today, for example, Melbourne's got much more value in it than, for example, Sydney. They've moved at different speeds. Brisbane has still got value in it. How do we find that value? Canberra, where is the value? What assets are in the value? So markets don't just, for example, at a macro level, go uh, you know, up in value 15 years in a row for your property to double or triple in value. It doesn't really work like that. It's rather like a bit of a snake. And at some points, the market is starting to go up. At some points, it's starting to go down. And so tracking that information is quite important. But also, you can tell from a macro level, perhaps uh, an area's had front-loaded growth. There's been lots of growth in the marketplace over the last couple of years. So potentially, it's about to go into a slower growth area or period. You could look at another market and it had, has had very little growth over the last couple of years, but it's building up. And so you might look at that market and go, that's a market I'd be prepared to pay a bit extra for to get the right property because it's got more growth to follow. And so again, when it comes to a macroeconomic conversation, we're looking at indicators all the time. Vacancy rates, median house price, time on market, gross rental return, weekly rents per dollar, and mortgage costs versus household income. So we're always looking at a macro level 
what is happening inside a city like a Melbourne or a Perth or a Brisbane to see how the market is trading. Obviously, at a macro level, you're taking into consideration interest rates and the cash rate. But again, you can start to sort of see if a marketplace is healthy, if it's got days on the market which are healthy. Now, in real estate, it's considered to be a balanced market at 90 days on market. If a property sells within 90 days, that's considered balance. Obviously, if a marketplace is 30 days, it's actually very, very healthy. When we look across Australia today using core logic data, most of Australia has uh, sales rates at like anywhere from 30 to 50 days. Very, very quick still as real estate goes to market. When we look at, for example, the vacancy rates for real estate, we can see that a balanced market is 3%. Most of Australia today is at 1%. So we know it's very, very healthy from a rental return point of view. But again, some markets will have a differential. For example, Sydney medium house price today is $1.2 million. Hobart is $700,000. At a macro level, maybe more affordable to go to Adelaide or Hobart or Brisbane or even Melbourne uh, to look at real estate than today Sydney at a median house price. Again, devil doesn't really start until we get into the detail, which is at a really micro level. But again, macro indicators are things we're looking for. So again, you could use quality based research to give you this information things like sqm research you know if we're tracking for example the vacancy rate we're seeing the vacancy rate plummet across all our capital cities and if you tracked it month on month you would be seeing that there is just a shorter and shorter vacancy rate you can get things like growth reports uh, which again from a macro level tell a macro story Remember, local factors determine the rate of growth, what you buy locally, how appealing it is. But from a macro point of view, there are all sorts of reports out there that you can get your hands on. Again, from a macro level, we might look at supply metrics, approvals, starts, completion, building construction data. And of course, This allows us to actually look into the future. We can start to see, is the future going to be an oversupplied future or an undersupplied future? And for the time being, a trend is undersupplied right now when it comes to real estate. There's less real estate being produced and really the next three years, there are low approvals and of course, low completions, which again tells us there is probably going to be more demand than the supply when it comes to real estate. So at a macro level, these are the types of things we can do. At a contractual level, uh, we also need to look at real estate. Real estate is contract law. Real estate is a real thing. It's a title. It's a block of land. It's a house, its fixtures, its fittings, its sewer, its easements, its right of ways. There are so many different pieces to the contract law puzzle. Now, I could probably do a whole episode on contract law. It's actually something I really love because it is quite interesting. In my workplace, we have uh, people who specialize in that. And uh, all day, every day, they're reviewing contracts, they're battling, uh, you know, what it takes to, to put together good, safe contracts. But in general, contract law is about real estate. And of course, the different types of ownership structure, for example, you can have freehold title or torrents title, community title, community strata, strata title. Uh, These are all different ways to own real estate. You can have different fees and charges for different real estate, ongoing strata fees, for example. You can have different ownership structures for real estate. You could, for example, 
have, uh, you know, co-investing agreements. Um, you can have all sorts of different rules when you're looking at real estate. And of course, when you're trying to find real estate and put a deal together, one of the big things you need to do as part of due diligence is make sure the contract is a clean contract, that it's not got any impacts on it. There is no assessment that is going to affect the real estate into the future. And of course, you need to also determine that the real estate on the property, the land, is actually going uh, to be what is prescribed in the contract and acceptable as part of the purchase, a permitted piece of real estate. So again, when you're doing your due diligence, this is where you're probably better off using professionals like a lawyer or a highly skilled conveyancer. They'll do things like searches. They'll do searches on the vendor. They'll do searches on the contract. They'll do searches on things you don't even know they're doing searches on. For example, uh, they'll look into things like road widening when it comes to where your real estate is. And of course, when it comes to reviewing the property title, they'll also look at things like easements, covenants, encumbrances, which are on the property. Now, again, when you doing your due diligence and you're trying to put together a property deal, don't skim here because quite often deals uh, may fall over at a contract law level when you think it's a perfectly good deal at a physical level and then all of a sudden you pay the cost to get a property reviewed by a lawyer, uh, you know, it's going to cost some money. And again, it's worthwhile, you know, that land may be contaminated. It may be on the asbestos register. So there's so much that needs to be done and checks and balances which need to happen for you to make sure you're buying a safe property. Now, the argument is, do you do it up front when you first put your foot on a property deal or do you do it at the tail end, making sure you're ready to go, for example, after your finance? Um, again, it's there's no right or wrong, but I've certainly been through the process myself where uh, I've fallen in love with the property. I think it's the bee's knees and uh, have got myself some contract law advice, realized it was a bit of a no-go asset. So terms of contract are really, really important. Uh, in different states, there's all sorts of different rules. There's different obligations. There's different settlement conditions. There's different time frames, different time of the essence. Uh, there's different legislation. Uh, in some states it's very, very common to not even do searches until you're unconditional, which blows my mind. You already own the property. Now you're searching whether there's going to be a future impact on the real estate. So just be very, very mindful that you, uh, if you are buying real estate, you probably want to align yourself with a team of contract pros because there is some dud assets out there. When we're doing due diligence, again, this is level three due diligence. We've been through macro. We know sort of what state or city we want to buy in. We know that the contract's clean now. Level three due diligence then takes us to pricing real estate. What should real estate actually be worth? And again, uh, there's a few ways to look at real estate and it's price. The first one, which is the most common in Australian real estate is basically trying to estimate fair market value. Now, fair market value is just the price of an of what the real estate would sell in an open market condition. In other words, on the weekend, if the property went up for sale, how many people are going to come to the open home? How many bidders would be interested in the real estate? And if it's highly prized piece of real estate, it's obviously going to have a, a higher market value than a property whereby no one wants to buy it and no one wants to step foot in the property. To determine fair market value, obviously, 
fair market value fluctuates every month. And again, real estate carries a volatility index to it. Generally, the volatility index of real estate can swing month by month by even up to 10%. But to estimate fair market value, I mean, a good way to understand it is past sales of similar properties and properties which are on the market today, which are similar in look and feel, size and dimension. So great way to sort of streamline due diligence. Now, again, for professional property investors, we tend to use core logic to give us some information on sales metrics, sales data, past sales information, and of course, what's on the market to estimate fair market value. The next method of due diligence you can use is valuation. Valuation is different to a fair market value. Valuation is generally done at a uh, valuer level, not an appraisal level. Remember, real estate agents do appraisals. Uh, Buyers agents do appraisals. Valuers do valuations. It's a big difference. So generally, inside of valuation, there are three methods to use when it comes to valuing an asset. The first one is direct comparison, very similar to what I just talked about, where you find like-for-like sales, sales which are very similar to the property that you have that are recently sold. The next method of valuation is known as summation or the cost method of valuation. Simply put, what does it cost to replace the property? That is ultimately the value of the asset using summation. Quite often in new construction, summation is one of the methods of valuation. What does the land cost? What does the build cost? You put the two together and you have a cost-based valuation. The final valuation method is known as the cap rate, which is basically a yield method of valuation. Obviously, if something's got an attractive return and it's uh, different to the rest of the market, it fundamentally is can be valued off its rental return rate. Generally, the cap rate, though, is used with commercial property, However, summation and direct comparison are generally used for residential properties. When I'm doing due diligence on real estate, I like to put my hat on as a valuer and see what they see. I like to do research as if I was them. Can I find enough direct comparables to support the property which is on offer? How does the rent look based on the cap rate of what the macro market is paying for rent versus what this property achieves in rent. I also look at the cost per square meter or the cost per build. Now, again, one way to buy real estate, if you like, which is uh, a good way to buy, is always to get a second opinion. Uh, After all, humans are humans. Humans are fallible. And of course, if you send three buyers agents to a property, they would all have a different opinion. If you send three, uh, you know, buyers to a property, they've all got different opinions. That's why properties go up at auction and people uh, forego buying at auction because the price is not what they believe. And you see that every weekend that everyone has a different opinion on real estate. From a valuer's perspective, valuers also have different opinions. And again, it is fallible because humans uh, have different biases, different opinions on real estate. So uh, you, it's very common to send two valuers into an asset. One's going to like it, one's not. It's just the way it is. Now, remember when you buy a property, typically you're borrowing money from a lender. Typically that lender will also engage a valuer to look at the asset and make sure the security is suitable to that lender 
and of course look at the value proposition of the asset to make sure they're not lending too much on a property which you're overpaying for. So generally, you want your asset to come in on valuation or, uh, you know, just a you know handful of bucks below. But most of the time, if you can hit Val, it's perfect. It's perfect because the banks also agree that the asset is in good order and it is the right price for what you're paying. But just remember, uh, when you're buying a property and doing your due diligence, you can engage your own valuer. They won't value it via instructions from a bank. They will do typically what a market valuation is, estimated fair market value. So generally, what we have seen is an estimated fair market value comes in higher than quite often a valuation where the bank is involved. So when you get a property which values in where the bank is involved, it's a good thing because quite often it's more conservative. The reason being is the valuation is not for you, it is for the bank. And of course, valuers are conservative because if they get it wrong, they have the wrath of the bank coming to them. Pricing, of course, is a a good way to research real estate. And of course, when you're researching real estate and doing your due diligence, you might look, for example, at segmented pricing. How many properties are in a suburb at the lowest quartile, the mid quartile, the highest quartile? Where do you sit within the segmentation of the median? Like, are you over the median, under the median, within the median? These are all some of the pricing work you can do when you're doing due diligence. Also, when you're doing pricing due diligence on an asset, you may consider, for example, the lending capability of an asset at that price in that particular suburb or location. And this is where you, for example, can use lenders' mortgage insurance calculators and tools, for example. Now, lenders' mortgage insurance is just the idea that if someone borrows at 90%, they're going to pay insurance because they're borrowing over and above what is considered normal to a bank, which is 80%. So generally, when you borrow 90%, particularly as an investor, you're going to pay mortgage insurance. Mortgage insurers also have suburbs they don't want to be part of. So you can find a very good property at a very good price, but also in a suburb where the lending is considered riskier. So when you're dealing with pricing, you want to fact check the price against the ability to lend in the suburb. After all, it's not your money, it's another person's money. And again, if the suburb doesn't uh, have very good lending conditions, a bit blacklisted, then quite often it can be very, very hard to own the real estate in that suburb and get a result from the real estate in that suburb. So it could be a good price, but a wrong suburb. Obviously, when we're looking and researching price, we also want to understand tenure structure. Tenure structure is just the idea that uh, the ideal proportion of people in a suburb is kind of 30, 33, 33, 33. 33% people who've paid off their mortgage, 33% of people who are basically carrying a mortgage and 33% sort of tenants. So if you go to a area and it's 90% tenants, that's not such a good thing because generally speaking, they're not going to be house proud people they're not going to look after the nature strip not because there's anything wrong with being a tenant just by virtue of the idea that if you have more home ownership in a neighborhood or people invested in a neighborhood by virtue of putting their own money into a deal and living there you get this kind of neighborhood effect which is very very positive homeowners with no debt, you get homeowners paying off debt and you get this really good tenure mixture 
which really supports values in the suburb. And of course, think about it from a risk perspective, from a pricing risk perspective. If there's a lot of people in the suburb with no debt, then if the uh, interest rates go up, obviously they don't even care. So you've got a less riskier suburb profile because of the debt levels in a suburb price tenure. It's a very, very important metric with real estate. Now, obviously, when it comes to pricing, there are styles and risks of property. And generally, I teach there's two sort of theories of real estate, if you like. There's buy, hold, depreciate, recycle. Basically, one version of the world where you get a more modern property, you buy it, you hold it, you get depreciation allowances because the property is more modern. And then Obviously, if you've bought a decent property, you recycle the equity out of it. The other version of it is buy, hold, renovate, and recycle. This is the second version. You choose a much older property, you hold it for a period, you touch it up, and again, you try and recycle equity out of it. Now, there's no right or wrong. There's just two models. And again, some people prefer buy, hold, depreciate, don't want to go anywhere near renovation. Other people prefer buy, hold, try and do some renovation and recycle. Now, if you're buying, I guess, a property which needs renovation, you're going to have to factor that into your pricing because you don't want to overpay and then do a renovation and you've overcapitalized. In some respects, personally, I prefer to buy someone's overcapitalized renovation for uh, less than what they paid than uh, necessarily do the renovation. I just find out in the marketplace there's plenty of wannabe renovators who get the metrics very, very wrong and, of course, don't price in the renovation correctly. Now, when you're renovating, it's very important to understand renovation costs today can be, depending on your location of the asset you're doing due diligence on, anywhere from two to $5,000 a meter, sometimes even more. And again, like you think about it, uh, if you've got 100 square meters that you need to renovate and it's 5,000 a meter, well, I think you can do the maths, right? So hundreds of thousands of dollars. And this is again where people uh, don't work out the right pricing. Now, again, I've I know people right now have got a property over in Paddington, beautiful suburb, paid two eight for it, needs a five hundred thousand dollar renovation at three three. Uh, if they did the five hundred thousand dollar renovation today, because the market's different, it would be worth two eight. It would not go up in value. That's that's the challenge of obviously trying to uh, price in a renovation. Now, remember, if you're going to do the buy, hold, renovate, recycle, you've just got to think of the five R's. Retain, rebuild, replace, remove, or repair. The cost per square meter is all different depending on if you're removing something. It's a lot cheaper, obviously, than rebuilding something. When an asset needs virtually a total rebuild, the square meter rate's going to increase. So if you've got a 200 square meter home and uh, 100 square meters of the 200 square meters needs a rebuild, you'll need to price that in versus a repair, which may just be a couple of screws in the wall or a lick of paint, very, very different cost structure. So you want to make sure when you're doing buy, hold, renovate, recycle, you just understand very well what you're doing when it comes to the price because you typically need to make your money in the buying process rather than the renovating process. You've got to price in the cost of renovation. So look, we're at 44 minutes now into the show. Uh, maybe the Jehovah's will come back and I can have a chat with them soon, but uh, we're going to keep going. As I say, this could be the longest program in the history of the show. In fact, right now, you're probably going, 
geez, that's a lot of information. Should we just shut up there and come back next week? No, we're going to power on. We're going to do it in one show. Uh, So again, capital costs, they're a real thing. Price them into your feasibilities when you're doing your due diligence. Now, I used to teach the 1030 rule, uh, which was just basically a simple rule of thumb. Uh, Remember, quality versus quantitative rule of thumb is for every 10 years of property is old in age, for every 10 years older property is, probably a better way of saying it, you're probably adding in $30,000 in renovation costs. But we've had inflation. So my 1030 rule is now my 1040 rule. For every 10 years older property is, uh, if it's an investment grade property, which is typically under $700,000, you've got to factor in about $40,000 in future capital costs. So by way of example, a 1970s property, which hasn't had much renovation, three-bedroom house, $40,000 per decade, five decades, it's a $200,000 cost. So again, you want to factor that into your pricing metrics when you're doing pricing. The next formula of pricing is you want to do a cash flow on real estate. You want to know what it costs you to own, run, hold, your after-tax, your pre-tax cash flow. You want to understand what the asset costs to uh, basically own and what you're going to get back in, for example, depreciation. You're going to want to price that in. Does it have intrinsic value through depreciation? Remember, properties basically built before 1987 don't technically have depreciation. You can get some if they're renovated, but if they're unrenovated, built before 1987, there is really no allowance you can get when it comes to their cash flow profile. So again, you would price that in to what it is worth. Uh, You would price it into your due diligence when it comes to how you approach the real estate. Obviously, from a pricing point of view, if a property's got better capital growth potential, it's going to come with a better price than, for example, a property which is, uh, you know, strange and weird and really just a property that is only ever going to suit the rental marketplace. So pricing's a bit of an art form. Uh, You can do all sorts of things to determine price, but really... Uh, understanding what things cost to deliver and what things are selling for is a great way to make sure that you're doing the right level of due diligence. So we've done, obviously, contract law. We've done macro due diligence. We've also done pricing due diligence. Now we're going to have a chat about asset due diligence and, of course, what you need to look out for. We're obviously buying a dwelling. We want to have a look at what the assets capability is like. Now, if a property is obviously established, built, an inspection is a great way to do some due diligence. You can look at the condition of the dwelling. You can look at the age of the dwelling. You can check out potential issues. You can even get building reports to determine structural problems or sneaky water damage issues, or any uh, issues when it comes to the regulation of the property. If it's built to code, or if it's now uh, basically facing some code reassessment issues, inspecting is important. Uh, You, however, may not be a building inspector, so you may prefer to outsource that as well. When you're doing, though, your normal inspection, just checking out a property, you may want to check out the fixtures, finishes. You want to make sure that uh, you've got um, all the rooms checked out. Now, you might go into a bathroom, for example, think, oh, it's a lovely bathroom. But then uh, if you don't sort of look closely, you may miss that it's not a full height tile bathroom. It's basically got one wall of tiles the rest is basically plasterboard again like 
These are the nuances of doing research on real estate. You may check out tapware. Uh, if a property's got a dishwasher, if it's got a double sink, uh, you know, if it's got granite bench tops or it's got laminated, uh, what the flooring is, the condition of the flooring. So again, you want to be able to do a physical examination of real estate, particularly if you're buying it uh, built and new. Um, and of course, have a bit of a look into what that looks like, the physical look and feel of the property. The other thing you might want to check out, which I think is really important, is street appeal and streetscape. Basically, the streetscape, if you want to understand it, is the frontage of the real estate. How does it front onto the street and is it pleasant? The street appeal is obviously the positive and or negative attributes of the street. Is it a main road? Is it a three-lane highway? Is it a quiet little back street where birds chirp? Is it a sunny street? Like street appeal is a massive driver of real estate and streetscape appeal. Some of the nicest streetscapes, if you like, are suburbs which are quite green and they have hedges and you've got beautiful uh, trees which change color every season streetscape and again for certain real estate most real estate streetscape is a very important due diligence checklist when it comes to design of real estate obviously there are some design levels of finish which i think are important when it comes to real estate. Probably from a due diligence perspective, you want to check out who is and who or who was the architect and builder of a property. You want to understand space. You want to understand volume. You want to understand flow, how the floor plan or house plan of the real estate works. You want to understand, again, at a asset level, light, ventilation, cross-flow uh, ventilation. You want to understand fixtures and fittings. Are they quality? Or are they going to break down in two years and you're going to be constantly going back and forward to Bunnings? Uh, you want to be able to look at the design of real estate and just make sure that it works. It works. Now, design timing is an interesting thing because, again, when there's, I guess, low levels of demand for real estate, you can actually get a better designed property because there's less demand. Often what happens to people is in a period of high demand for real estate, there is lots of property on the market and it's hard to get the quality piece of real estate because there's just too many people shopping and pushing the price up. So in some respects, really when the equilibrium is, there is a surplus of property, it's actually not a bad time to pick up a highly designed piece of real estate, which is going to have good pedigree. It's going to have good design characteristics to it. Now, remember, when you're doing your research on the physical asset, the dwelling, the three design logics. Design logic one is functional design. Functional design. I just sort of talked about that before. How functional is the layout? Is it functional to walk through the property? Is it functional to walk from the kitchen to the living room? Is it functional to walk into the bathroom or is it a tight squeeze? Is it uh, is virtually the toilet in the shower? Like functionality matters in real estate. And again, this is where when you're buying an asset, the more functional it is, the better off you're going to be because the less costs you're going to have when it comes to retrofitting it to become functional. Sometimes I prefer just the layout of a good functional piece of real estate um, over everything else. If it flows, if it's got good uh, 
circular space. It's such a beautiful piece of real estate to me. The second design logic is behavioral design logic. What behavior does the real estate create? Does it create a behavior of sitting on a sunny porch and having a wine? Does it create a behavior of bathing? Can, does it have bathtubs? Does it have, create a behavior of electric car charging? What behavior does the real estate create? And of course, the final design logic is reflective. When you walk into the property, do you go gaga? Does it make you feel good? Or if it's a much older property, can you turn it into a property which is going to create emotion? Reflective design is just reflective energy. And again, I always describe it, why do men wear a Rolex watch or ladies have a Prada handbag or vice versa? Um, it's because... We want to be proud of what we have. And again, if you walk into a property and it's got beautiful high ceilings, it's got integrated fridges, it's got, uh, you know, wine fridges, and you're just like, wow, this thing's just off its head. This is reflective energy. And for property investors, obviously, you know, the more you spend on reflective energy, the higher cost for the real estate but at a basic level, like you want to have nice kitchen, bathroom, uh, and so forth, which which you know resonates even with the tenant market to get better rent, reflective energy. Obviously, then we're up to the final part of the puzzle, which is micro due diligence. Remember, micro or local factors determine the rate of growth. When it comes to macro factors, factors that's really more the health of marketplaces however i personally prefer to buy at a micro level because i know that just having a good property in a good street in a good suburb with the time horizon i attach to it is going to outperform a fad at a macro market level over the long term at the end of the day real estate is an emotional sport it's an opinion sport and if you can get real estate with a good opinion at a local level, it tends to always perform. So at a local level, you want to sort of dig into what type of local area is it? Is it a premium suburb? Is it a affordable suburb with a lot of livability? Or is it a suburb which has to change and transform because it's really a brand new precinct? Again, at a premium level, you've got a different set of due diligence than, for example, a suburb which never has never existed before. Completely different level of due diligence you need to do. But what I like to do at all levels is, for example, check zoning, land use regulations, what's happening in the suburb, what parts of the suburb are being earmarked for commercial, retail, density, what suburb, what part of the suburb is designated to green space, open space, character housing. When you start to look at zoning maps and you drill into where your asset is, uh, you can work out if it's going to be impacted into the future. I also like to do a character test. I like to understand the surrounding housing, the positive attributes, the negative attributes. I like to understand you know, where the real estate sits in its character from, for example, retail, in its character from transport, in its character from jobs. I like to also understand what type of dwellings are in a suburb. A bit of a character test. Is it going to be a charming old suburb which was built 200 years ago? It's probably got a lot of character. Again, it's going to come at a price tag. If it's a newer place, what does that character look like? And it's not about old versus new. If it's a newer place, you just want to make sure it's got beautiful parklands. If it's house proud neighborhood, you want to look at the character, make sure you, when you drive through there, there's no, you know, uh, bogans walking around smoking bongs and pushing shopping trolleys. It's a character test. I don't know. I probably shouldn't have said that. It's taboo these days. Maybe I'll let the, uh, Jehovah's in and see if I can repent. 
All right. So when we're doing micro due diligence, we also want to look at, for example, travel times, mobility. We want to look at things like what do people do in the suburb to get to where they need to go? Uh, 70% of people using a car, 10% of people using a train, uh, 3% of people walking, uh, 1% of people on the bus. Like, how do people move around? Is movement important to people? Do everyone Does everyone need to live close to the train station? Because driving is a disaster zone. Again, what does that do from a local level if we're closer to the train line, not on top of it, but closer to it, does that improve the values movement? Is there price movement we can get when it comes to a micro level? Obviously, when we're looking at a micro level, we also want to look at the fringe benefits of the next suburb. Perhaps we're looking at a suburb which is also locally overpriced. And if we just go one kilometre further down the road, we're going to pick up value price variations by distance and appeal. It's a very, very important piece of due diligence to look at when it comes to real estate. Obviously, some suburbs are brand names. And even if you go to the next or neighboring suburb, it may not carry that brand name and it may never carry that brand name. So again, we need to weigh up these options in our due diligence format. What I also look for at a local level is the history of the suburb's rental market. I like to understand if it's been a landlord market or a tenant market or a bit of both. Uh, A tenant market is where really the vacancy rate's been 3% or more, uh, the tenant's in charge. A landlord market, really the landlord's in charge when the real estate in that marketplace is less than 2%. Really, typically, the landlord is capable of putting the rents up. So one thing I like to do is look at the history of a suburb and go, well, this suburb has been a landlord suburb for 15 out of 20 years. It's obviously more pro to getting rental increases than stagnation or rental decreases. And of course, you can find blips, like if you look at the history of suburbs, you might find between... 2020 and 2022, large vacancies because of COVID and things like that, you obviously realise that there was a significant event during that period so you can kind of rule it out. You also want to look at, obviously at a local level or a micro level, the local vacancy rates, also the local days on market, the local uh, also rents per dollar, You want to take what we talked about earlier in the micro world and in the macro world rather and apply it to the micro world. Local figures are kind of important. Clearance rates, days on markets, two-bedroom selling, three-bedroom selling, four-bedroom selling. Uh, You want to understand median sale price in the suburb compared to the metro or greater city. You want to understand discount rates. You want to understand also, obviously, the return versus, at a local level, versus the macro return. Considering, again, that valuation methodology of cap rate. You may want to also consider, for example, rent gap theory. And again, I spoke about rent gap theory, I don't know, last podcast or two podcasts ago. It's just the idea that a suburb becomes unaffordable when people are spending 30% of their income on rent. Again, if they're a high income society or high income suburb, potentially that's not a problem. If they're a low income suburb, potentially they're they're at their threshold of what they can pay you in rent. So again, you don't necessarily at a local level want to buy a, a property and never be able to put the rents up. That doesn't sound like too much fun. So we can also do, for example, neighborhood affluence checks. We can work out, you know, what are suburbs like at an affluence level? Are people earning a good household income in that suburb? We can also check out, for example, where the property sits in comparison to schools, what type of schools they are, if they're great schools. We can work out, again, all sorts of factors which are going to 
determine the likability of the real estate. Of course, other things to consider are the uh, in your research at a local level is you might want to do your own, for example, environmental and or flood report by virtue of council to make sure that the property that you're buying is not impacted by things nearby you. And again, even when your lawyer does a environmental or flood report, they're doing it on the title, but, you know, half a kilometre away could be something that is significantly going to impact the value proposition of the asset. It could be something like a, uh, you know, uh, a tip, a garbage tip, not a waste management centre, but a full-on garbage tip. Like, it could be something like that which is going to affect you. So you want to be able to pull some reports, use mapping, find your uh, overlays, things like heritage, floods, bushfire. You want to be able to go, well, there's a bush close by. If that sucker lights up, is it going to burn my house down? Um, and again, like if it's a local small bushland, the odds of the fire department being able to control that is a, probably a lot easier than a huge, 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 you know, uh, a, a area of bushland whereby they're going to struggle. So again, you've got to use some common sense because a nice outlook of green space is also very, very valuable. You probably want to do a demographic check. You can do this at a local level. Uh, how many professionals are in a suburb? What type of jobs do people typically do in a suburb? Uh, is it a growing suburb when it comes to their income profile? Is it a growing suburb in their industry profile? And you can do that quite often by looking at, for example, the 2021 census versus the 2000 and I think it was 16 census you can go, okay, well, in this suburb, actually professionals have gone up by 5% in the last five years. That's a healthy sign that potentially there's more money coming to the suburb. You can say, okay, the wages or household income's gone from 88000 to 116000 That's a good signal. That's what we're looking for when it comes to local factors driving the success of property. Obviously, you can look for pop population metrics. Um, now, of course, Areas where there is, you know, huge population going quite often are in what are known as population corridors. In other words, they're basically cow paddocks where houses are going and, you know, they're always going to get a higher population figure or growth rate because they don't, uh, they're an attraction magnet really for new housing. Uh, inside of suburbs already built out, you're obviously going to get a different level of population growth. You know, for example, some suburbs in, you know, new greenfield communities, their change in population will be something like a thousand percent over the next 30 years. Obviously, an infield location, you know, a built out suburb, the population increase may be 30 percent. But it kind of makes sense. So you want to understand the dance that's going on when it comes to more people going to a place. And is that a reflection of that area needing to be supplied? Or is it a reflection of an area which cannot be supplied? And again, generally when uh, land runs out, it tends to go up in value. So remember, local factors determine the rate of growth. This is why the local stuff is probably more important. It's the most thing I care about today is local stuff. People always ask me, what do I think of this market? What do I think of Darwin? I don't care. I care about what street in Darwin, what suburb in Darwin, what piece of land in Darwin. That's what I care about. Um, so, hey, I apologize if I'm not a macro guy anymore. I feel like I've moved past it. I'm a micro guy. You can call me micro. Call me micro Sam. So remember, there's three characteristics that drive real estate values at a micro level. Land characteristics, location characteristics, and building characteristics. Building characteristics, obviously, the dwelling that 
is on offer. Is it a good dwelling? Is it an A-grade dwelling, a B-grade dwelling, a D-grade dwelling, which is going to be a money pit because you're just going to have to prop it up. Remember, better properties rent better. So better buildings and better dwellings rent better. They carry more cash flow. Renters want a nice standard of living to rent. And of course, we'll pay more for a better building. Land characteristics are important. And again, when you review your due diligence of real estate, you may look at suburb mapping to look for things like green space, how close the park is to your real estate. And of course, at a due diligence level, when it comes to land, there's two versions, remember, and I've spoken about this before, and I'll, I'll talk further about it down the track, no doubt. You've got for townhomes and apartments, asset to space ratio, i.e. there's an apartment, how much free land is around the apartment? Is it built near green space? Is it built near open space? Is, it, is there the ability to both live in the apartment, but also use the free backyard, the soccer field across the road or up the street? That's the concept Obviously, if you buy an apartment and it's got no free space, the asset is all it is, then of course you often find that those apartments don't flourish because there's no free space. So again, because of affordability, a lot of people are choosing townhomes and apartments today and they uh, tend to make good investments if you can find the asset and the free space at a local level. And of course, for land, you generally have the concept known as the land to asset ratio. What proportion of the land is actually used uh, by the asset? What is that asset worth, the dwelling worth, and what is the land worth? And again, for property investors, if they've got good land value in a house, they tend to do very, very well at a good localized level. So for a property investor, these are some of the considerations at a local level we're looking for. We might even use, for example, Rule 72, which is just a simple rule. We go back two years, five years, 10 years to see growth rates. And if we can work out the accumulative growth rate in the past, it could be evidence that we're going to see good growth into the future. Of course, if there's a lack of growth, we need to question why. Why has there been a lack of growth? Of course, it may go back to the top where the macro market is yet to grow and hence that is the opportunity. We also, at a localised level, may like to consider supply to sales ratio. This is an interesting one because, again, the idea in a suburb there's turnover is normal. Typically, in a suburb, around 5% of the suburb, its stockpile of real estate is sold every year. So every year, around 5% of the suburb goes to market and gets sold. Obviously, you can apply that a suburb's going to have a population growth of a certain percent. And in general, Australia grows by about 2%. So if by way of example, you added 5% more stock to a suburb where the average turnover every year was 5%, well, then you're creating 10% stock that is being added to that marketplace. And of course, potentially the population is only going to grow by 2%. 2% plus the normal 5% stock being turned over is 7%, meaning you potentially are putting an oversupply into the suburb. Obviously, population growth corridors get 1,000% capital growth so what happens in those precincts, the metric is a little bit skewed, but certainly in suburbs whereby there is a traditional level of uh, stock in the market, 
if there's a huge amount of stock that's coming to disrupt the market in an inland suburb, infill suburb, a suburb close to the city, then you've got to be able to work out if it's going to change the market dynamics and, of course, create a trend of a short period of oversupply. If it is going to create a short period of oversupply, Maybe that's still an opportunity, but now you know that you can put the price down and negotiate better terms and conditions of your property purchase. So uh, I guess when it comes to also at a uh, micro level, you may want to be looking for something that's going to drive capital growth, something that's all going to push capital growth. It may be that the suburb itself has very good views in it and certain streets in the suburb have very good views. Again, these are some of the micro things we need to look for. Now, other than that, you've got things like the predominant dwelling type. Do people prefer a four-bedroom, three-bedroom, two-bedroom, a two and three bedrooms, the predominant side, they're pretty equal? Like what and how do people like to live? Obviously, at a local level, you can look at supply levels, current supply of a suburb. You can look at uh, development applications for a suburb at a micro level. You can work out, is it going to be supplied into the future? Uh, Are developments going to impact your real estate? Is there an oversupply coming? Now, again, I'm a professional property investor, so I use things like Cordell's to give me a time Uh, laps look at supply coming through the funnel really quite often it gives me about a three-year window of what applications are underway when things are going to be built when things are going to be completed inside a suburb and I can sort of look and look over those horizons and go wow that suburb's got 30,000 properties coming to it in the next three years Maybe I should give that one a miss or I can look at a suburb and go, wow, that property's got three knockdown rebuilds coming to it this year. Plus this property, wow, that's a pretty good deal. I should get in there. There's no problem with what the property is going to face at a short-term trend level. Now, there's obviously uh, second-hand properties where we've got a be mindful of our renovation idea and then there's newer properties and newer properties as well also need a little bit of a checklist you can do things like who uh, the architect is the builder designs floor plans fixtures fittings you can see if the real estate's going to be appealing to owner occupiers you can also look at uh, you know what the real estate is going to B, is it going to be part of a master plan community? Is it going to be a small boutique development? Is it going to be a bulky development? Does it have very good land to free space ratio? All of that can be uh, part of your due diligence along with things like site plans and master plan outlay. Of course, uh, you can also do a new versus new pricing matrix, trying to work out does your new properties actually fare better than other new properties? And if so, why? And if there is a reason to that and a good reason as to why at a local level it is a better priced asset. Obviously, you can also do a new versus old delta price matrix, the average delta, the price difference between a new property and an older property. And I see this all the time. Like there are some new properties, fairly well priced, the same price as secondhand properties when you take into consideration capital costs for secondhand properties or the 1040 rule. And there are certainly new properties where the average delta price differential is way too expensive and there's no way that new property is worth buying because it the delta is too far apart. Average delta or average price discrepancy. All right. Well, that's it. We made it. One hour and 18 minutes. One hour and 19 minutes in about one second. Uh, hey, as we say, 
it's better to buy well and never sell rather than uh, put yourself in a situation where you buy a lemon. So hopefully today's show helped you understand some of the due diligence you need to go off and do to uh, become a level three property investor, level three due diligence. All right, I'm going to go and see if I can find uh, the Book of Mormon or the Jehovah Witnesses and uh, see if they can teach me anything. Catch ya. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.